This week on WealthTrack, global growth is accelerating. That is the headline in this week's exclusive 2017 Outlook with Wall Street's number one economist Ed Hyman and five-star fund manager Matthew McLennan. The global economy and markets are next on Consuelo Mack WealthTrack. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Thornburg Investment Management, Active Management, Flexible Perspective, Rosalind P. Walter. Hello and welcome to this edition of WealthTrack. I'm Consuelo Mack. Every year on WealthTrack, we bring you an exclusive interview with legendary economist Ed Hyman, founder and chairman of Evercore ISI. Hyman has been voted Wall Street's number one economist for an astonishing 36 years by institutional investors. And we always pair Hyman with a top-ranked money manager. In this case, we are delighted to have Matthew McLennan, head of the global value team at First Eagle Investment Management and portfolio manager of the five-star rated First Eagle Global Fund, which he has run since 2008. The two know and respect each other and bring different perspectives to the table. Last week, we covered the outlook for the U.S. in 2017. In a nutshell, Hyman is encouraged by the pickup in strength and confidence in the economy and markets and believes a recession is years away. Value manager McLennan is focused more on the risks he sees developing, particularly excessive fiscal stimulus and the high levels of debt and stock prices. Well, this week we are broadening the discussion to include the rest of the world as well. As a recent headline from Hyman and his research team at Evercore ISI emphatically put it, global growth accelerating. I began the interview by asking Hyman, what is driving global growth? So we had a lot of fiscal stimulus, uh, a lot of monetary stimulus, China in particular, uh, and then uh, last year, uh, ECB stepped it up. European uh, Central Bank. Mm -hmm. uh, European Central Bank, uh, Mario Draghi, whatever it takes. Right. And China is on a whatever it takes. Uh, my China partner, Don Strassheim, told me that this morning, <laughs> whatever it takes. In China, they're still doing a lot of infrastructure spending. And uh, in Japan, they've been on a complete whatever it takes. Right. Hasn't produced much. And so you have that. And, and then the price of oil came back. Mm -hmm. And so you get that was a real drag on the economy last year. Now that's coming back. Just because and, of the, the energy sector was a drag in the economy. Was, was but lower oil prices are supposed to be a stimulus. A wish, right. right. But it looks as though you got the hurt. Uh, a lot more, and as Matt, I think, eloquently put it, uh, you're still at a moderate price mm. uh, on energy. And I get the feeling that there's a little bit of uh, positive feedback, what mm -hmm. you would like in an expansion, uh, where employment gains, uh, wage increases lead to consumer spending. So car sales came out uh, for December, and they mm -hmm. were stronger than expected, over 18 million. Uh, bank loans, uh, Matt mentioned, are, are now positive. Last week. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I get the feeling there's a little bit of a positive uh, feedback loop going on. And Europe, uh, the, the data is getting better. Mm -hmm. uh, I just spent a, a week in France and it new cars and it felt good even before I had a bottle of wine. <laughs> and <laughs> then uh, in, in China, uh, I've been watching... Uh, nominal GDP, right? not the real part, but the real and the price, uh, which I think is the more important measure. And uh, without much notice, uh, it's come from 6% uh, in 2015 to over 9% uh, currently. So that's GDP, real GDP plus, plus inflation. inflation. And for and everybody, uh, inflation sounds bad. It's, Mm -hmm. negative connotation, but uh, if you can you know, raise the price of a car or raise the airfares or if an asset manager could raise the performance of the, the fees that you charge, assets under management, uh, Starbucks could raise the price, 
that's great. Or you if, make more money. And, and, if, you and can, if people get a pay increase, right. they feel better. So nominal GDP has accelerated significantly in China. Uh, and Japan is doing a little bit better, but it's the, uh, the least clear to me. So it looks like it's picking up a little bit. And they have enormous monetary stimulus uh, in Japan. You're talking about stimulus, and you're seeing evidence of it finally kicking in. And that's my question to Matt, finally kicking in record amounts of stimulus all over the world. It's, you know, I mean, how much more? Uh, we're getting a very little bang for all of those bucks, it strikes me. And, and it's a concern of yours that we've got all this money that's been created, right? Well, you know for sure you can't Debt. make all people wealthier in real terms by just printing money. Um, and the problem that we have in the world economy is that you know, the imbalance we discussed in the context of the US of having too much debt is not local to the United States. Mm -hmm. If we look at debt to GDP, you know, household plus corporate plus sovereign in Europe, in China, in Japan, in each of those regions, it's higher than it was in 2007. So it's like a hot air balloon that's gone mm. pretty high. We had a growth slowdown uh, 12 to 18 months ago that Ed referenced. And the, the central banks of the world and the fiscal authorities responded reflexively to that with easy policy to keep the hot air balloon inflated. But the imbalances remain in place. Right. We have sovereign balance sheets that look like post-war balance sheets. Yet when we look at the geopolitics of the world today, it almost feels like pre-war geopolitics. We've had a total breakdown in the Washington consensus uh, around the world. We have- uh, and, and the Washington consensus being just about globalization. Globalization, about, uh, you know- Liberal the, trade, about- um, You know, r rational economic policy, all of mm -hmm. these sorts of things. We've seen a pendulum swing um, start to, to move towards uh, populism mm -hmm. um, and nationalism. Mm -hmm. So it's not just- um, the electoral outcomes that we've heard people talking about in the United States. Uh, we talked about Brexit uh, last year, um, and we see the emergence of um, more autocratic uh, nationalist regimes around the world. And so I think that the geopolitical backdrop has become much more complicated. You know, and, and I think that this makes it a very uncertain state of nature to be predicting on a more structural basis. You know, I agree with Ed that what we're seeing short term is, a, is an uplift. Right. But as we look out, 12, 18, 24 months, five years into the future, the crystal ball gets very foggy because of those structural imbalances. And I think about China in particular. Um, China reached a high water mark level of fixed capital investment that was um, hard to um, even conceive of. You know, China was consuming half the world's iron ore and 40% of the world's copper for a, a country that's 20% of the world's population. Mm. The government's been doing what it takes, to use uh, Ed's term, um, right. to, to keep that in place. But by doing so, um, by trying to support something at an artificially high level, they risk compromising the sovereign balance sheet in China over the medium term. And so these are some of the things that, that bring us concern. Ed, you know, I'm just you know, thinking about this growth acceleration, which is real all over the world. And so the stimulus seems to have worked to a certain extent, but also the economies themselves, uh, as you're describing it anecdotally, initially uh, they really are improving, right? I mean, is you know is employment picking up in the rest of the world as well? Uh, you know, are businesses doing better? Or you know, all of the things that that make an economy work. So it, I it's think it's improving, still early. Right? It's improving. Yeah. I think maybe I'm overstating it, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm you know I'm say an expert at looking at the tea leaves. Yes. And they're looking better. Yes. They're picking up a little bit, but that was in, in France and it's, it's still pretty slow. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I think we're still sort of early and I do worry that uh, we could get, you know, suddenly too much inflation. And uh, you might not have seen it, Matt, but this morning, the, I think the World Bank reported global GDP Global debt to global GDP. I didn't see that. It was 365 percent. Mm. You know, much higher than just a, a, a grim reminder uh, that there are these risks out there. Right. But I, I think that uh, the problems will occur when inflation is picking up and central banks are tightening. 
And, and, and right are now, you so seeing far, inflation picking up now in other parts of the world? You, no. You're not. No. So that's important. So then that, so that's going to be a key and I'm not seeing much indicator for you. I'm not seeing much inflation here either, except for wages. Right. And so many places, uh, it looks like pricing power is so difficult because of intense competition, mm -hmm. like in the auto sector, the air, the retailing uh, sector. In the, in the case of uh, healthcare, education, uh, there's definitely pricing power and inflation going up there. So the expression this time, it's different. So is it possible that there is something else besides central banks raising rates that this time is different that could actually you know, do a, give a real body blow to economies, could slow them down uh, and rather than the, the traditional. Things, the things that Matt's talking so about. So Matt, you know, well, I, I would what, say, what other you than think some could really hurt the global economy. Well, other than some sort of geopolitical right. dislocation, which you know, we, we'll put off to one side because it's, it's, it's hard to analyze. It's interesting to think about um, some of the non-US economies uh, and the cycles that they've gone through over the last 30 years. And I think of Japan as an interesting case study because um, this was an economy that got over indebted somewhat ahead of the other uh, sovereign economies of the world. In real estate? It, um, in real estate. Right. They had an investment boom and, and then they tried to make up for the slack through easy fiscal policy and then their government uh, debt to GDP got very high. But what we saw in Japan was something that felt like a nominal ice age. Uh, for the last generation. GDP in nominal terms went pretty much sideways. The market point to point has gone pretty much sideways. Interest rates have been pretty much zero. Um, and we still had economic cycles despite the central bank not raising interest rates. And what was a catalytic force for some of those economic cycles was outsized exchange rate movements. In a world where interest rates go to close to zero, the perception that one region will raise uh, interest rates is enough to propel its currency up Mm -hmm. uh, which acts as a break on its economy. And so we saw the Japanese experience some recessions uh, you know, with strong currency. Um, maybe that's a risk for the United States now. Mm -hmm. With a dollar in, so in a, strong. In a sense, you know, Ed referenced the fact that you know, in Europe, their recovery is early stage. Unemployment's still close to 10%, whereas the US has gone from 10 to 5. Mm. Europe is benefiting from a cheap currency, not an expensive currency. It has a current account surplus. It has lower real interest rates. So it has all of those things uh, um, supporting it. Um, Japan as well has a 10-year bond targeted at zero. If you go back to the US by comparison, the dollar is expensive relative to its 15-year average, despite the fact that we have a current account deficit. Why is that? It's because interest rate differentials mm -hmm. are supporting portfolio flows. Right, so everybody's coming and buying US uh, denominated but assets. The, the stronger the dollar goes, um, the more that is, uh, it pressures corporate profit margins uh, in the US, um, and, and it has its own contractionary effect. Mm -hmm. You're essentially exporting deflation from Japan and from Europe. Even China's been depreciating against the dollar um, to the United States, and that's what complicates the whole picture here. And one of the things that you've said is, is that uh, China has stopped exporting deflation to the rest of the world. Can you explain that and why that's significant? Well, first, it's, uh, it's showing up everywhere. Uh, the UK inflation rate has moved up a lot as energy prices move through. But uh, the China uh, producer price index uh, declined for about four years. And it was a major mm -hmm. uh, they were exporting deflation like crazy, and the German PPI went down, our PPI mm -hmm. has gone down. And we, part of that was you had a, a complete manufacturing recession because prices are going down. Right. And now the China PPI uh, has been going up for almost a year. Uh, wow, that's a change. So as I mentioned, the uh, nominal GDP in China has already accelerated 300 basis points you know, from 6 to 9%. Right. And all of that is price. The, the real GDP has been mm. the same all through this. And so I think it generally accepted uh, that global deflation is behind us. Mm -hmm. uh, say, Mario Draghi in his last uh, press conference said the risk of deflation is greatly diminished. And so right. that's, that's, that's behind us. What's in front of us is I guess, more t tricky to figure out. Investing in the rest of the world, are there many more opportunities overseas? You know, where are you finding them? Where are you finding great companies? That 
yeah, cheap prices or it's it's tricky actually because e even though if you look top down at the overall valuation of uh, international markets they look a little cheaper than mm -hmm. the US market mm -hmm. but much of that valuation discrepancy is concentrated in the financial sector and in some of those economies where financial repression is more entrenched um, it's going to be a long time before those financials can earn attractive ROEs. Um, they have lower equity, equity to asset mm -hmm. uh, ratios as well, and many are needing to recapitalize. We've, we've had to see, you know, we've seen an Italian bank bailout in, you know, in the, last, um, the last month. And so when we look at businesses of like quality, um, I would say that the valuations that we're seeing outside the United States are similarly high to what we're seeing in the United oh, interesting. States. interesting. There is, there is no broad brush stroke um, mm -hmm. valuation discount. The one thing that may be cheaper is the currencies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, currencies like the yen and the euro and um, Mexican peso, et cetera, have all fallen fairly dramatically uh, versus the dollar. I have no idea what's gonna happen to them in the next 12 months. It depends how hawkish the Fed is. But um, looking out over the long term, um, you know, having some diversity of currency may be beneficial at some point. Um, if the gap between uh, U.S. growth expectations and the rest of world growth expectation um, uh, moderates mm -hmm. a, a little bit. But for us, it's really company by company. Our cash levels in, in our overseas fund are similar to our U.S. value fund. They're in around, the international fund. They're, they're around mm -hmm. 20%. Mm -hmm. um, and so... And, and repeat, you know, what that signifies. Well, well again, it's, you know, it's, it's not a uh, market timing call for us. We view cash as deferred purchasing power. Mm -hmm. We like to buy businesses that control a certain niche of the economy um, that are persistent in nature and free cash flow generative and with prudent managers. But we only like to buy those businesses when we get a margin of safety in price. And so the cash flexibility enables us to be patient buyers. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that our cash is close to 20% means that bargains are harder to come by. Our cash levels were low in 2009 when markets were in distress right. and there was a lot to buy. Um, so we're very patient buyers, and on average, we hold businesses for close to a decade. Um, and you know, what enables us to be patient holders is the nature of the businesses that we're buying. And what enables us to be patient sellers is that we have that potential hedge in gold um, so that our more mature investments um, sit across from this potential hedge. Um, and so we have a decade cycle time that goes on in our business, but it's very much company by company. Mm -hmm. And, and Ed does not have a decade cycle time because you're looking at what's <laughs> the, the data coming out every single day. And on, one of the things that you had said uh, in our last program with you about the U.S. economy, that even though the recovery is long in the tooth, uh, that you, you think that the potential for recession is, is several years out. What is the feeling um, that you have about recession potential in Europe, for instance? Or I think it's I think it's pretty much painted by the same brush. It is right. Uh, so Matt uh, pointed out that uh, the unemployment they're really early. Yeah. Their unemployment rate is ten percent, uh, and but is it going in the right direction? Is it, it going it's down? down. Yeah. It is. It's definitely right. They've turned the corner. Uh, that looks uh, pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say Matt is uh, one of the best students of which markets to look at of mm -hmm. anybody I know. So you're asking the wrong, you should ask him. But uh, we uh, favor the U.S. And I would share with you and your viewers that, that right now this is a pretty standard view. Uh, Does that worry you, Ed? I mean, at some. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if of, everyone thinks one way, uh, there one must my, be something wrong. One of my, uh, uh, I guess my favorite mentor in the business, uh, who is a great timer, uh, says, I've made most of the money in my career being with the crowd. Interesting. The reason he's done much better than the crowd is he knows at what point to leave. Leave, right. <laughs> but you, you can enjoy the crowd uh, for good periods of time. But I'm just saying that is, it worries me some. And the whole thing is a little bit overdone right now. Uh, but uh, aside from... Uh, and we agree with that, being right. U.S. centric, mm -hmm. uh, with the policies here. Uh, but we also like like Japan, and think that that's our second favorite uh, space. And why is that? Uh, what improvement are you seeing in so Japan? The, so the economy's doing a little bit better, uh, and they have so much monetary stimulus mm -hmm. in the system, uh, and it looks like it might be starting to work. Mm -hmm. 
And, and also, what about the corporate reforms that my understanding was that they were, which they have not been very shareholder friendly, that there's, is that a function? Yeah, and yeah. I'll ask Matt that. You should ask Matt that, but right. that is an important point. Right. No, I, I agree with Ed on that. I think, you know, for those of us who've looked at Japan for a long time. Yes, and you've been in and out of Japan, I, I mean, but, a, a but again, time. individual companies. Individual companies. Right. We've definitely seen an improvement uh, in uh, shareholder orientation of mm -hmm. Japanese companies. And I, I think sometimes they get mischaracterized. I think many of the businesses we uh, own in Japan are some of the best businesses in the world. They have very strong market position, mm -hmm. management teams that are fanatical about extending their, um, their lead uh, in the markets in which they operate. What's changed is their willingness to distribute the, the free cash flow of their business to shareholders. shareholders. So we've seen dividend payout ratios move up. I mean, a decade or two ago, it wasn't uncommon to see many companies pay no dividends or have 15% right. payout ratios. We have companies in our portfolios now where company, uh, in uh, Japanese companies, where the management teams are returning 60 to 80% of their earnings. Um, and that's a really big uh, shift in uh, uh, corporate governance. Uh, we're seeing higher presence of independent directors. We're starting to see a little bit more valuation sensitivity in the M&A um, that's being done in Japan. And so on the whole, we've seen um, the pendulum swing in the right direction there. Rise in populism, Brexit. Um, how big a deal is, has that been to the Eurozone economy, to the UK economy? So far, I thought, it was, I thought the wheels would fall off. Right. And uh, I remember right after the Brexit, uh, we were get, getting ready to uh, hire somebody, and we stopped. <laughs> we said, well, let's wait. Right. It was like Y2K, but, and then yeah. We went ahead, went, went ahead and it seems right. as though, uh, you know, you've, I, there's still a risk, but it looks as though Brexit really hasn't impacted the UK economy. Right. It'll be interesting to see what happens in the French and German elections. Yes. yes. Right. I think uh, we'll get another read on, on whether um, that pendulum shift to, to populism is becoming more broad-based and, and what that could mean. I mean, the reality is that the UK is yet to uh, file Article 50 and, and, and formally leave. Right, the uh, vote happened, but the actual Brexit has not occurred. And, and we don't really know who the political players will be that will be negotiating this on the mm -hmm. European side of the equation. So I think there is a, a little bit of uncertainty there. All right, final question for each of you, and I'll start with Ed this time. So uh, for the one investment for a long-term diversified portfolio, kind of ex-US, what would you have us invest in? The Nikkei. The Nikkei. That's why I would, anyway, outside the US, I would favor right. the, the, the US, uh, but that's our, our, our first choice. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think, uh, if I may add on to what we're talking about, that yes. uh, the, these votes uh, coming up this year are a good reason to hold your cash, because mm -hmm. you could find a good, you know, it could be an opportunity. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, if if there's not a problem, the market's acting as though there's not a not a problem. Uh, so if if that if there wasn't a problem, that might not work. But our favorite investment outside the U.S. is, is Japan. Mm -hmm. and I think Matt. you know, within the context of Japan, um, an example of an interesting business mm -hmm. um, that that we like a lot in Japan is is Fanuc. Uh, which is and remind one, me what Fanuc is again. Uh, Fanuc is the company that no one's ever heard of that uh, is responsible for a lot of the cars that you would drive. For example, they're the world's leading provider of servo motors and computer numerical control systems uh, for robotics. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, they control about sixty percent of the world's market for servo motors, and they're vertically integrated into robotics. And what's interesting about that sixty percent market share position is that you know, no matter what car you drive in the United States, the vast majority of them are going to be painted by a Fanuc robot or welded uh, or assembled in some way or another. And one of the deflationary forces that's been going on in the world is the trend towards factory automation. Yes. Um, Fanuc is a beneficiary of that trend. So thank you both very much for joining us on WealthTrack for, you know, for two sessions, one in the US last week and on the rest of the world this week. And of course, always to have yeah. Ed Hyman on as a WealthTrack exclusive. Yeah. What a treat for us. And being joined by Matt, a yeah. wonderful mutual fund manager, portfolio manager as well. So thank you both very much for You're being with thanks. us. Thank you, Consola. At the close of every wealth track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is consider Matt McLennan's philosophy of patient capital. McLennan and his first Eagle team are willing to hold cash if they are not finding the right opportunities in the market. 
As McLennan told us, price matters, and most stocks look overpriced to them at the moment. Consequently, they are holding cash positions of around 20% in their portfolios, waiting for better prices and those higher margins of safety they insist upon. Until they find them, they are willing to be patient with their own and their shareholders' capital. Next week, we will be joined by another value investor who is even more cautious about the market. International Value Advisors co-founder and portfolio manager Charles DeVoe will explain his 40% cash holdings. In the meantime, in this week's extra feature on WealthTrack.com, Ed Hyman and Matt McLennan, who are both avid and eclectic readers, share some of their favorite books with us. We also look forward to hearing your comments and recommendations, so please continue to reach out to us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for watching, have a great weekend, and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Thornburg Investment Management, Active Management, Flexible Perspective, Rosalind P. Walter, and the Fairholme Foundation.